our Savior and the Live Love Nation. Welcome to worship this morning. I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and stand on up. We make our beginning this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. So glad to have you with us this morning online. Welcome. Sing along with us.
78. I was 11 years old. I had three different paper routes. I had the Cleveland Press, which was delivered in the late afternoon, and I had two separate Cleveland Plain Dealer paper routes, which were delivered every morning, seven days a week. I saved for months. I saved my pennies for months to buy one of these. It was a Battlestar Galactica handheld electric game. Okay, now you got to remember, this is 1978, right? I mean, this was cutting-edge technology. It cost $38 back in 1978. In today's dollars, that would be $157.25 is what it was. I saved my pennies for months. I finally had enough money, and I remember my mom and one of her neighbor friends were sitting at the kitchen table. Mom, are you watching out there this morning? And so I, I, was, I, I told my mom, I'm going up to the store, and I'm going to buy this Battlestar Galactica game. And she simply said to me, Paul, are you sure you want to spend that amount of money on a game? Are you sure that, that, that that's what you want to put that amount of money to? She laid a guilt trip on me. Okay, for 40-some-odd years later, I continue to remember that guilt trip that she laid on me. I mean, it just came up like two weeks ago. We got together on a Saturday afternoon, and somehow or another, Battlestar Galactica came up. You know, we have a tendency to hold on to stuff, don't we? Now, I know, it's just kind of a, I, I just joke with her and give her a hard time. It was about 10 years ago at Christmas. She finally gave me one and told me to shut up. That was it. It was over with. Okay, but I still haven't let go of it. 
We so often do that when people hurt us, don't we? When people say something mean, say something bad, hurt us in some way, we hold tight onto how they hurt us, and we refuse to let it go. And at times, it can, it, it can hurt us, it can harm us inside. God calls us to love just as he loved us. God calls us to forgive just as he forgave us. And it was in the book of Hebrews where God tells us, if we turn toward him, he will remember our wickedness no more. He will remember our sin no more. And so this morning, I just want to pause for a moment. Let's go before our Father in heaven, before his throne of mercy and grace, and we confess our sins privately in the silence of our own hearts. We confess our sin before him, knowing that he hears us, knowing that he loves us, and knowing that he forgives us. We pray. Father, we stand in awe of your great love. And even though at times, Father, we hold on to the sins that people do against us, we hold on to the hurts that, that people have done towards us, but yet, Lord, because of your love, because you are love, you forgive us. And Lord, we stand in awe of your grace, that undeserved mercy, that undeserved love that you shower down upon us. And because of what you have given and done for us, we know that we are loved, that we are forgiven, that you remember our sin no more. Lord, we love you. We thank and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, it's with great joy that I get to announce to you the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because of what he has given and done for you, I can assure you that your sin, all of your sin, is forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun. It's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be seen.
continue to worship the name of our God. Amen? Amen. Please be seated. I want to wish everybody here this morning a, a happy Sunday to those of you who, us who are joining us in worship. Uh, also to those of us who are online today as well. We have some folks down in Town Shores just down the street. Uh, Comic New York, also Blowing Rock, North Carolina. Thank you for joining us for worship today. Uh, we just want to say a big thank you uh, to, to the entire Living Love Nation uh, for what you've done over the past few weeks in terms of bringing in supplies and donations for Operation Christmas Child. It has been great to see. We've been able to pack over 160 boxes uh, that we will be sending out through Samaritan's Purse uh, to reach kids all over the world during this holiday season. So thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for all of your help in that. Well, uh, you know, when I was in kindergarten, uh, our, our teacher, she had this clipboard that was at the front of the room, right by uh, the, uh, the chalkboard. And uh, whenever you misbehaved or you did something that you weren't supposed to do, she would walk up to the front of the room and she would write your name on that clipboard. Now, as a five-year-old kid, that clipboard scared me to death. And so I made sure to make sure that I didn't get on that clipboard at any time during the year. In fact, by towards the end of the year, I, I was actually the only one in the class that hadn't gotten their name on that clipboard, but all of that changed uh, one day during lunch. We're in our classroom, we're sitting around the tables, and uh, I don't know why I did this, but for some reason, there was this girl, Tiffany, next to me, and uh, I decided to put bunny ears behind her head. And, uh, and everybody at the table, they thought this was funny, except for one girl who went up to the teacher and told her what I had done, and I can see this in slow motion, even to this day. My kindergarten teacher got up out of her chair, she walked to the front of the room, and as she wrote my name on the clipboard, she said my name aloud... And there was this gasp among the room. Oh, Christopher got his name on the clipboard. Oh, can you believe that? And I was just sitting there frozen, embarrassed. Everybody's talking about it. Well, thankfully, a couple minutes later, lunch was over. Everybody forgot about it. But for the rest of that day, I had this immense amount of shame and guilt for putting bunny ears on Tiffany. Now, fast forward almost 10 years to eighth grade, graduation day, we had a class of 25, we, we graduated, we had our ceremony, and then we had this, this after party. It was at this multi-purpose room, adult chaperones, food, drinks, we had this, this music, we also had a dance portion that happened later in that event. And here's the thing, for all the middle school, I had this crush on this girl in my class, uh, but I, anytime we had a middle school dance or a, a gathering, I, I never worked up the courage to actually ask her to dance because she was, quite frankly, way out of my league. And so here I am, graduation night, we're at this party, and you know, I'm talking with some of my friends, and all of a sudden, the girl that I've had a crush on for three years comes up to me, and she says, hey, Christopher, do you want to dance? 
And I'm like, who, who, me? And she's like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, uh, 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 sure. So we, we go out to the dance floor. Remember, this is middle school. So if you're going to slow dance with somebody, you got to keep the, 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 the six-foot rule, right? Like we were already social distancing before it was even a thing. And so we're out on the dance floor. We're dancing. And as we're talking, about halfway through the song, she says, hey, Christopher, can I tell you something? And in my head, I'm thinking, you can tell me anything. Like you are so beautiful. Like whatever you want to say. She said, Chris, um, it's going to be really difficult to leave this school after all these years, and, and we've had so many memories as a class, but you know what? The one thing that I will never forget about you is when you got your name on the clipboard in kindergarten for putting bunny ears on Tiffany. And friends, in that moment, I don't remember what I was thinking, but I can imagine that it was something like this. Really? Really? Of, of, of all the interactions we've had over the ten, past 10 years, that's the thing that you remember? That's the thing that you're going to take with you? That one time that I got in trouble in kindergarten? Now, friends, here's the thing. I was still excited and happy to be dancing with this girl that I've had a crush on for years, but at the same time, I could not believe that she remembered something that I had done wrong all the way back in kindergarten. You see, friends, we, we as humans, we remember a whole lot of stuff, don't we? Right? Like, we remember dates, we remember the day that we got married. We remember the, the day we had our first child. We remember the day that we lost a parent. We remember things like, like images. We can picture the first time that we saw snow. Or we can picture the, the, exactly where we were and we got that call that, of a job offer that we've been wanting to get for so long. We can remember things like feelings. Like that feeling you had on, on Christmas Day as a kid. Or the way you felt after your first breakup. Or the way you continue to feel every time your family forces you to watch a Hallmark Channel original movie, right? We, we remember feelings. We also remember jingles. The best part of waking up is what? Folgers in your cup. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Or how about this one? For a great low rate, you can get online, go to the general and save some time, right? We remember jingles. And then, of course, there's all these other random things that we remember. Like, to this day, I still remember the color of the carpet of the home daycare that I was at when I was three and four years old. Why do I remember that? It doesn't serve any purpose in my life, and yet it continues to be stored up here. You see, we as humans, we, we remember a whole lot of things. And you know what? In addition to all of those things, some of the things that we remember are when the people around us mess up, make a mistake, say something they shouldn't have said, do something they shouldn't have done, right? We remember all of these things. In fact, you can think of it like this, that within your brain, you have rows and rows of boxes, and each of these boxes has a name of somebody in your life. And whenever that person makes a mistake... Whenever they mess up, whenever they say something they shouldn't say, whenever they do something they shouldn't do, it's like you take out a piece of paper and a pen, and you, you, you start to write out exactly they're wrong. Like, oh, you interrupted me. Oh, you, 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 you broke a promise. You were 20 minutes late. Oh, yeah, you, 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 you lied to me. You told me that you were going to get this done. You, you embarrassed me in front of people. Friends, from the moment people walk into our lives... We begin to keep a record of all of their mistakes and all of their wrongs. And over time, we continue to add and add and add to that box. And it gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And friends, here's the thing. Some of the people in your life, they don't just have one box. They have multiple boxes, right? Like the nosy neighbor next door, she's got two boxes. Or how about that coworker that's lazy? He's always stealing stuff from the community fridge. He's got six boxes, right? Your children have a box for every year. One of your children has a box for every month. Grandchildren, of course, they don't have any boxes, right? Because they can do no wrong. But if you have a spouse or if you have a significant other or somebody you're dating, man, they've got rows and rows of boxes in their lives, right? You see, when, when people come into our lives, we begin to, to keep a record of all the mistakes, all the things they're wrong. We, we take sheets of paper, we write it down, we remember it, and we store it in our record of wrongs deep within our brain. You know, we are in a, a week four of, of a message series that we are calling Love What the World Needs Now. And the idea 
is that each week we're looking at different aspects of the biblical understanding of love in the hopes that you and I can better love God and better love people. Okay, and here's the thing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul lays out a very important aspect of what love is not. Take a look. He says, love keeps no record of wrongs. Love keeps no record of wrongs. You see, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to take a look at what it might be like for you and I to live a life in which we refuse to keep a record of wrongs. In other words, what would it be like for you and I to say, hey, if I'm going to love Jesus the way that, or I love people the way that Jesus loves me, then this can no longer be a part of my relationships. Because love in its very nature keeps no record of wrongs. You know, and I used to work with, with college students. At the beginning of every semester, we would do this uh, activity called Stop, Start, and Continue. For example, what are the things we need to stop doing? What are the things we need to start doing? And what are the things that we need to continue to do? It was a great time for us to sort of reflect on our current situation and determine what we need to do to change for the future. Okay, and so in light of what Paul says this morning, that love keeps no record of wrongs, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a look at what Scripture says in terms of something that we should stop doing something that we can start doing and said, and something that we need to continue to do throughout it all. Stop, start, continue. That's what we're going to be doing today. Okay, here's the first one. That if we are going to love people in the ways that Jesus loves us, then we need to stop keeping records of wrongs. Friends, you know what often stands in the way of you loving people in your life? This box Right, This box that is filled with all sorts of records of wrongs. And, and to be quite honest, if we're honest with ourselves, the reason why we hold on to these things is so that we can pull them out at the right time when we need to make our point. For example, your spouse says, hey, you're interrupting me. What do you say? Ha, huh. well, you're always interrupting me. What about that time, for example, this morning when you, when you interrupted me? Well, I was talking about a, a, a coworker situation. Or how about last night when you interrupted me when, when we had the couch situation? Or, or how about all the other times where you use your voice, you try and talk over me, give your own opinion. You think I'm bad at interrupting you? Look at you, right? Or how about this one? Let's say you have a coworker, calls you out in the middle of the meeting, embarrasses you in front of your coworkers. What do you do? Oh. I've got, a, I've got a whole record on them, man. If this is how he wants to play, oh, man, I'm going to call him out. Like, I know he's the one that stole my boss's lasagna from the fridge, and I know that he is saying that he's going out meeting with clients, but he's kicking it at the beach. I've got the proof. I've got the contact. In fact, I've got all this stuff. He's going to think twice before he tries and messes with me again. Or how about this one? Your, your friend says, hey, you failed to keep a promise. You said that you would come to my party. What do you say? Promise? Promises? Hold on a second. What about that time in 1998 when you said you were going to give me a Furby for Christmas? You promised me that. It's 2020, and I still don't have my Furby. Don't talk to me about promises. You see, friends, if we're honest with ourselves, oftentimes the reason we hold on to these boxes, these records of people's wrongs, is so that we can pull them out and use them at the proper time. But you know, here's what Paul says in, in Romans chapter 12. Take a look. He says this. He says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. You see, friends, one of the reasons why we hold on to these boxes is because deep down we have a desire for justice. If somebody does something wrong, we want to make sure that they get punished for that. And oftentimes, when we see people in our lives, when we see these boxes and we see them do wrong things, we believe that we are the people that need to hold them accountable. But you know what? As Paul reminds us this morning, our job isn't to even the score. Our job is not to keep the record of wrongs. That's God's job. God is the one who keeps the record of wrongs. And as we're going to talk about later this morning, he's the only one who can actually do something with them. 
And so you know what? When you and I continue to hold on to these records of wrongs, what it does is it continues to weigh us down. I don't know about you, but man, (laughs) it is exhausting and tiring to have to carry around other people's wrongdoings. And here's the thing. The longer you carry them around, the more and more you begin to resent that person in your life. It's tough. What do you do? You resent that person. How do you make it happen? We have to think about these ways differently. Now, here's the next thing in terms of keeping a record of wrongs. If we're going to be able to do this, um, Max Lucado puts it really well in terms of this resentment. Take a look at what he says. If we're going to do this, he says, resentment is the cocaine of the emotions. It causes our blood to pump and our energy level to rise. There is a dangerous point at which our anger ceases to be an emotion and becomes a driving force. That's why bitter people complain to anyone who will listen. And like cocaine, resentment can kill. Physically, with high blood pressure and other conditions, emotionally, with anxiety and depression, spiritually, as it shrivels the soul. And then he says this. He said, hatred is the rabid dog that turns on its owner. Revenge is the raging fire that consumes the arsonist. Bitterness is the trap that snares the hunter. But mercy, mercy is the choice that can set them all free. You see, friends, if we are going to better love people in the ways that Jesus loves us, then we have to be willing to stop keeping a record of wrongs. That when people say, hey, what you said to me hurt, What you did to me hurt, but I refuse to add it to your box. Okay, that's what we should stop doing. Here's what we can start to do instead. It's simply this, that we can start praying for the people in our lives. You remember Jesus' Sermon on the Mount? You remember what he said about this? Take a look. He said, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You see, friends, when we stop holding on to record of wrongs, all of a sudden we're freed up to do other things. And one of those things that Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, he says, hey, listen, when somebody wrongs you, when somebody continues to hurt you, I know that you want to just reach in there and you want to shove it back in their face, or I know you just want to write it down and put it in there, but here's the thing. Here's what you can start doing instead. You can start praying for that person that the next time they do something like this, it's like, God, I am struggling my neighbor is so annoying. My coworker is just the worst. My family member has hurt me deeply, and I am tired of carrying around this resentment towards them. And so, God, I pray that however it is the way that they are, I genuinely pray for healing for them. I genuinely pray for peace for them. I pray that they may come to know and be surrounded by people who will love them and encourage them and support them. And God, if you want me to be one of those people, then I pray that you give me patience. And I pray that you help me to be kind. And I pray that you help me to use my words, not to tear them down, but to build them up. God, help me to love this person in the ways that you love me. You see, friends, when we stop keeping records of wrongs, we can start praying for those in our lives. And as Jesus points out today, it will dramatically impact the ways that we love those people that we have a hard time with. And as Pastor Paul said a few weeks ago, it may not end up changing them, but it will almost certainly end up changing you. And it starts when we turn to our God in prayer. Okay, so that's the second. We, we stop keeping records of wrongs. We start praying for the people in our lives. Here's what we need to continue. We need to continue to forgive. You know, when Paul says that love keeps no record of wrongs, what he's saying is that love is forgiving. And friends, here's the relationship between the two. The more we put into these boxes, the harder and harder it becomes to continue to forgive. You know, a few years ago, uh, we were living in an apartment complex. We had a downstairs neighbor, and she was just one of the worst neighbors we've ever had. I mean, she was, she was annoying. She was rude. She was inconsiderate. She was noisy. She had this nasty smell in her apartment that would sort of 
come through the walls of our stairwell and it would come up into our house from time to time. She had this dog that she never trained. And so when she would be gone for the day, it would bark for hours and hours and hours upon end. In fact, it got so bad one time that when nobody else was home, I, I ran down the stairs right on the wall where the dog was and I began to bark back. <laughs> now here's the thing. Number one, I'm glad nobody was home because I probably looked crazy as all get out. Number two... It actually didn't help. It only made the dog bark louder. But you know what? Here's the thing. At the end of those two years, I had like six boxes on my neighbor. I could recount every single time that she had wronged us. And here's the thing. Because I had all of those things that I was carrying around with me, it was really hard for me to continue to forgive her. But you know what? One day, and I, was, I was sitting at the table and I was prepping for a confession and absolution, and the dog was just barking and barking and barking. And all of a sudden, it was as if God just opened it up. And I didn't put it in these words back then, but I'm going to put it in the, the terminology that we're using today. Here was my neighbor, and she had six boxes. And I was finding it really hard to forgive her. And then I thought, hey, Chris. How many boxes does God have on you? I'll bet you he's got tens of thousands of boxes. In fact, you won't even begin to able to count how many boxes that you have in terms of all the things you've ever done, the mistakes you've made, the ways you've dishonored God, the ways you've hurt people around you. God has boxes and boxes and boxes on you, and yet... None of those boxes ever stopped him from continuing to forgive me. Because, friends, as Scripture tells us time and time again, God is love, and love in its very nature is forgiving. That's the very essence of who God is. Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4, says, If you, Lord, kept a record of my sin, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Romans chapter 4, verse 8, blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sin no more. You see, friends, the reason why the gospel is truly good news is because when Jesus came down into this earth and he died for our sins, when that happened, he took every single one of our boxes and he destroyed them. He obliterated them. He shredded them. He burned them up. Done. Gone. Finished. Our God keeps no record of wrongs. And he proves it to us time and time again when he continues to forgive us for every single thing that we ever do. You know, friends, I imagine that there are people in your life right now that are very difficult to forgive. And the reason why some of those people are difficult to forgive, well, at least one of the reasons is because it's really hard to let this go. But friends, if you want to be free, if you want to have peace, if you are tired of carrying around your resentment towards that person, then you got to let it go. You see, I would argue that what the world needs right now is a type of people who chooses to stop keeping records of wrongs, who chooses to start praying for them instead, and who chooses to continue to forgive them every single time. And friends, if you and I can be that type of people then we can begin to love people in the same ways that Jesus loves us. Because as he showed us on the cross 2,000 years ago, and as he reminds us every single day, love keeps no record of wrongs. Zero. Zilch. Nada. Not even when you put bunny ears on a girl in kindergarten. Amen? Amen. Please join me in a prayer. Heavenly Father, you have created us and designed us to have a brain. 
And, and part of that brain is that we store memories, all sorts of things, the good, the bad, the ugly, everything in life we experience, we remember, or at least we remember for a time, and then it fades away. But Lord, sometimes we come across people who wrong us or do harm to us or make repeated mistakes, and it's really hard for us to forget those things because it's like we, we store them up in our brain, we keep a record of their wrongs, and yet you remind us today that love in its very nature keeps no record of wrongs. And so, Lord, we ask today that you would help us to consider the relationships among us, whether it's our spouses, significant others, our, our kids, our, our grandkids, our, our children, family members, coworkers, neighbors, whoever they are, help us to consider the people that we are having a hard time forgiving or that we are having a hard time being around, or that we are having a hard time letting go, and we ask that the Holy Spirit that dwells within each and every one of us would help us to stop keeping these records of wrongs, and to start praying for these people instead, and to continue to forgive time and time again. Lord, we are reminded every day that we are here, that we are your children, that we will be with you in eternal paradise because you chose to no longer keep a record of our wrongs. You took those records to the cross and you destroyed them on our behalf. And Lord, we give thanks for that grace this morning. We give thanks for that forgiveness that you offer to us. And we know that there are people in our lives right now that need that forgiveness too. And though it may take us some time, it may take us some time to heal from the brokenness that we see in our lives. You continue to be with us and strengthen us and guide us to be those forgiving people in this world. Lord, we pray these things by praying the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the part of the service that we would usually take up the offering, but obviously in this season, things are very different. And so for those who are here in worship today, we have a, a plate in the back. Uh, those of you who are worshiping online or even here today, uh, you can always give at OurSaviorFL.org. We just want to thank you for continuing to give during this season so that we can continue to reach people uh, here and all over the world with the gospel of the fact that we have a God today and every day who will not keep a record of our wrongs. Let's stand now and let's join together in worship.
Come on. 